South Africa's first ever Cricket World Cup in Australasia in 1992 was played against a backdrop of extreme political uncertainty. Back home at the same time, white South Africa were voting in a referendum for political change. If that vote was no, the cricketers would be unceremoniously pulled from the World Cup. As it happened, that vote was yes. This is the story of that yes. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. The following is an extract I wrote for my book, The Art of Losing, Why the Proteas Choke at the Cricket World Cup. At the Sydney Cricket Ground on the 26th of February 1992, nearly two years to the day that Nelson Mandela was released from Victor Fister Prison, South Africa played Australia in their first ever Cricket World Cup match. The game was preceded by the Lightning Tour to India and several friendlies, the ICC having given the South Africans special dispensation to arrive early and play in more friendly matches than other participants given that this was their first exposure to official international cricket in 22 years. The first friendly was in Harare against Zimbabwe. The rest were on a trajectory moving progressively east through Australia. In one of them, at Perth in Western Australia, Peter Kirsten remembers coming up against a pencil-thin left-arm seamer, Bruce Reed. Kirsten fretted and scratched for 17 runs, but the exposure was invaluable. South Africa were gingerly testing the treacherous waters of international cricket once again. Alan Jordan, the team manager, who had only months earlier completed the redrafting of the new United Cricket Board constitution with Percy Son, remembers the sense of nervy trepidation in Perth. Quote, the guys were saying things like, there's Jeff Marsh, there goes Bruce Reed when he walked down a corridor or looked into a changing room. You could distinctly feel the tension. Five years later, when we played a four-day game there in 1997, Hansi Cronier was captain. He said, don't worry, boss, we'll fuck them up. Whether everyone admitted it to themselves or not, I think the feeling was very much like we didn't do too badly after that game against Western Australia ahead of the World Cup in 92. But don't forget that the guys were terribly raw. I sat next to Mike Proctor on the flight to Perth. He told me that this was his first ever proper overseas tour. After a three-wicket loss to Western Australia, a side containing Tom Moody, Damian Martin, Terry Alderman, Marsh and Reed, the South Africans had only four more warm-up matches before the World Cup. They won three of them, the fourth being rained out. In the two most important, against Tasmania and Pakistan, They recorded impressive wins, Brian McMillan taking 5 for 32 against the Pakistanis as the South Africans won by 17 runs. Played at Canberra's Manuka Oval, the match unfolded in what was to become an all-too-predictable fashion, creating an early template for the tournament itself. Batting first, the South Africans could barely muster a competitive total, Kepler Vessel scoring three fours in his 114 balls 72. In the end, they crept to a scarcely credible 205. At halfway, they can't have been excessively optimistic, yet they managed to defend their score, Richard Snell taking 2 for 27 as he supported fellow all-rounder Macmillan. For Vessels, though, the match represented a personal fork in the road. Although it was slow, he was happy with his innings, feeling it signalled that he was reaching a potentially rich vein of form. Quote, The warm-up games were important because our preparation for the tournament was really good, and matches like the one in Adelaide against South Australia were part of that, said Vessels. Part of the problem with our two early losses in New Zealand once we got there, to New Zealand and Sri Lanka, was that we couldn't prepare properly, but when it came to preparation in Australia, that was excellent, said Vessels. Vessels remembers the Adelaide matches for another reason. While the South Africans were there, he bumped into Alan Border, an old friend, ally and opponent, who had been his state captain when he arrived in Queensland to serve his Australian residence qualification. 
The Australian skipper was captain in Queensland in a Sheffield Shield match against South Australia and everyone happened to be sharing the same dressing room at the Adelaide Oval. Vessels took the opportunity to have a chat. Listening to Border confirmed Vessels' suspicions that, despite winning 17 of their last 23 ODIs, with five lost and one no result, the Aussies were fatefully overconfident. Quote, I just knew after listening to Border that there was a complacency creeping into that Australian team, reasons Vessels. They were very definitely vulnerable because they'd reached the other end of their peak. Eleven days later and South Africa were due to face an Australian side expected to do well as one of the tournament's co-hosts, along with New Zealand. The nerves and sense of giddy expectations was palpable as a South African team bus left the Hilton Hotel and made its way through the Sydney suburbs to the SCG, a journey lasting approximately half an hour. Quote, it was absolutely quiet in the bus. You could have heard a pin drop, remembers Kirsten, at 36, one of the oldest members of the side, and a player who had been embroiled in a sometimes fractious debate about the composition of the World Cup squad beforehand. Vessels agrees, but remembers an edge to the silence. Quote, The bus journey was a scary one, he says. I don't think I'd ever experienced that before. The guys were switched on, but they were also scared. I felt it could go either way. The sense of expectation wasn't confined to the team bus. South Africa at large was drawing its collective breath in advance of President F.W. de Klerk's bold call for a referendum, with whites being asked to vote yes for political change on the 17th of March that year. There was magic in the air that day in Sydney, but there was also a palpable sense of fear. The public, the fans and the team itself weren't sure whether humiliation was around the corner or if the best they could hope for was to simply be competitive. Few dared predict a South African win. Almost constant rain in and around Sydney added to the tension in the build-up. The team was unable to practice, although they netted at the SCG on the eve of the game. Writing in the Sunday Times the following Sunday, Edward Griffiths told the story of the Australian fast bowler Merv Hughes passing a net in which Alan Donald was placing a cone on what he thought was a good Australian length. Quote, that's too full, mate, Griffiths reported Hughes as saying. Put it there and you'll go clean out of the ground. Donald apparently went pale with anger. Although the cricket match stood clearly in the foreground, the broader socio-political canvas wasn't lost on the scribes. As Saturday Star parliamentary correspondent Sean Johnson put it in his column of 15th February, quote, The referendum will be decided by the largely apolitical mass of whites in the middle. These people will not be interested in ideology. They will ask themselves, on the balance of probabilities, which course of action is likely to do their lives the least damage, and they will elect to ride the tiger because this is the only means of transportation available. While whites opted to ride the tiger, the men nominally known as Springboks arrived at the ground close to noon. They deposited their kit in the famous SCG dressing room and went out to inspect the pitch. Quote, Adrian Caper looked around and wheeled his arms wildly, reported Griffiths. Donald began his high-stepping victory dance for no particular reason. Jaunty Rhodes waved to an imaginary cheering crowd. After 22 years, it had all come to this. Instinctively, the squad linked arms in a tight circle, a full makar, and clinched in their third shout of box. The practice, common in rugby, has been eagerly adopted since last year's win in Delhi on the Lightning Indian Tour. Vessels and Jordan had invited Alan Jones, the former Queenslander and coach of the Wallabies Grand Slam winning side in 1984, to speak to the South African team the night before the Australia game. It was a decision Jordan wasn't entirely comfortable with, but in the end, Vessels held sway. The team had received invitations from other quarters, Rod Stewart was in town and the promoters of his concert were happy to give the South Africans 20 free tickets. Paul Harris of Rand Merchant Bank had offered the team management a day out in Sydney Harbour on a luxury launch 
paid for by the bank. Vessels would have none of it, refusing both invitations. It was locked down for the team in their inner city hotel. The only relief from a frustrating and rain-bedeviled schedule of net sessions was Jones. Jones may have pointed out that although the Australians were at home, there was apparent indecision in their ranks. Marsh, who had opened for the test side in the first test against India at the Gabba the previous November, had lost his place to Wayne Phillips by the time of the fifth test in Perth. However, Marsh had been deemed a risk worth taking for the Australian ODI side and was back in the saddle, although the Cognoscenti remained unsure of whether he was a long-term answer. It had certainly been a long, hard summer. The test side had beaten India 4-0. Ravi Shastri scored a 572-minute double century in Sydney, and a beefy South Australian called Shane Warne played his debut there, while the West Indies also made a lightning visit. They didn't play any tests, their trip running parallel to that of the Indians, but they played six matches, including one against an Australian eleven in Hobart, in which a side featuring Brian Lara, Carlisle Best and Keith Arthurton lost by an innings and 93 runs. Quote, We walked into that hotel room for the chat with Jones, thinking that there was no ways we could beat Australia, says Snell, nicknamed the decadent one by Jones. We left it thinking there was no way in the world that the Aussies were going to beat us. In recalling the event, Jordan felt Jones made two key points. He told the team that the bus trip to the ground was vital because during the journey, all thoughts about anything else were to be banished. Quote, when you step onto the bus, the game has started, he told us, recalls Jordan. There are to be no jokes, said Jones. Every man has his own thoughts and you concentrate on what you have to do. The second point that struck a chord with Jordan was that the South Africans needed to handle their first setback with equanimity. Quote, he said that international sport was very closely contested and it often boiled down to how a side faced adversity for the first time. I wasn't that keen on having him talk, but Kepler knew him from when he played cricket for Australia. I thought he'd push an Australian agenda, but he was very neutral and very professional. We were all extremely impressed, said Jordan. That afternoon, Vessels lost the toss and Border chose to bat. Vessels admitting later that he was quite happy to avoid making a decision. Donald funneled all of the previous day's anger into an opening delivery that appeared to have Marsh caught behind by Dave Richardson. But such was the roar within the SCG that umpire Brian Aldridge couldn't be sure of the deflection and his finger remained down. The moment Jones had warned about had arrived sooner than expected. Quote, our first setback arrived early, reports Vessels drolly, but the South Africans got on with it as Marsh and his opening partner David Boone rattled along to 42 without loss before Boone was run out. It was the highest Australian partnership of the match. Wickets rolled and tumbled. Caper burgling two in and over, including that of Border to a pinpoint swinging Yorker. It was the crucial wicket of the innings, according to Vessels, and Australia were bowled out for a paltry 170. The South Africans were halfway towards their first act of grand World Cup larceny. Vessels and Andrew Hudson opened the South African innings. They were appropriately watchful, sensing a fabulous victory in the making. Hudson drove Craig McDermott down the ground for three. Vessels, bravely obdurate in that perennially crabby way of his, went about seizing the day. Kirsten joined him with a total on 74, Hudson having been bowled by Peter Taylor for 28 as he attempted to heave through the leg side. Slowly the two guided the innings into safe waters, then on to what increasingly seemed like an inevitable victory. Vessels' 81 not out was a knock of determined brilliance in the big Sydney ground. Kirsten's was counterintuitive and slightly out of character in that it contained only a single four. Quote, I phoned my wife back in South Africa in absolute glee to tell her about our nine-wicket win, remembers Kirsten. When she asked how much I made, I said 49, and all she could say was, why didn't you get 50? It was a busy evening for Kirsten. 
After a tearful acting minister of sport had hugged vessels, Steve Schwerte turned emotionally to the little batsman from Border. Quote, he came across and congratulated me, Kirsten tells me during a second test against Australia at the Wanderers in November 2011. Then he planted this big kiss on my sweaty forehead. You've saved the country, said Schwerte. You'll never forget those things, never, never, ever. With well wishes, fans and the insistently curious milling about and pumping flesh, there was pandemonium in the South African dressing room. Schwerte and Ali Bacher were there, as were dozens of journalists. Barry Richards came down after the post-match press conference, as did the official leader of the opposition, Frederick van Sael Slubbert, who estimated later that South Africa's victory translated into a full 10% more people voting yes in the referendum, which was now only three weeks away. Jordan remembers happy chaos. The players' dressing rooms are pretty close to the stands at the SCG anyway, and people were spilling into our change room. I just told the guys to put their kit away and let the chaos reign. Some guys actually went onto the field to escape it all. So many people were in there. I remember Brian Davidson, the former Rhodesia and Leicestershire player who had retired to Tasmania. He was there. Mike Gatting was in there too, hugging Steve Schwerte. Schwerte had spent much of the previous few days at the Australian Parliament in Canberra. While there, he spoke to the Australian Press Club, the official opposition and Parliament itself. Accompanying him was Bacher, the first managing director of the United Cricket Board of South Africa. Both were tired and emotional. Quote, After a round of engagement, we travelled down to Sydney together, says Bacher. We sat in the ground throughout the game, Steve and I. We were obviously aware of the political connotations of the match and the background to the game. But I doubt very much that all of the team were. They were youngsters. There were players like Jonty and Hunsey in the side. They were there to play cricket. I'd like to think there was provision made for them to vote in the referendum, but I can't say for sure that we did vote. By the time of the referendum, nearly three weeks later, South Africa's World Cup campaign had gone from the sublime to the slightly ridiculous, as the win against Australia was followed by consecutive losses to New Zealand and Sri Lanka. Flying on the Thursday morning from Sydney to Auckland after the Australia game, the South Africans arrived in New Zealand to find no practice facilities. It was exactly what Vessels had predicted, but hardly helped the side with their preparation. Quote, I knew what the New Zealanders would do. They had us practice in a parking lot, he remembers. Part of the reason why we got off to such a bad start once we got there was that we just weren't able to net properly. After the New Zealand loss, the setback coinciding with the first time that Vote Yes hoardings appeared at World Cup grounds, the South Africans experimented disastrously with Kaper in the pinch-hitting role in the following game against Sri Lanka. They noted how the Kiwis had played relatively unconventional cricket against them in the previous match, opening the bowling with Dipak Patel, an off-spinner, and encouraging left-hander Mark Greatbatch, their burly opening batsman, to hit over the top early on in his innings. Caper, though, was unable to emulate Greatbatch. He scraped together 18 in 44 balls, and the experiment collapsed in quiet ignominy as South Africa lumbered to 195. Vessels taking until the 36th over to get the total to 114. The game was lost narrowly but lost all the same, the South Africans being beaten by three wickets. The faxes, which had started arriving after the fairy tale victory over Australia, started changing in tone. Quote, I don't know how the hotel's fax numbers became available to the South African public, remembers Jordan but there were so many of them I could have filled a briefcase. They were a book in themselves. There were faxes after the New Zealand game, but they started getting really heavy after the Sri Lanka loss. Some of them were horrific. Of the about 600 that we received, I must have shown the players only about 30 of the 600, the good ones of course, and after that I just threw all the others away. The South African's fourth match of the World Cup was against the West Indies in Christchurch a match they had to win to stay alive in the competition. The West Indies were a frightening proposition. 
They had some thoroughbred fast bowlers and some casually destructive batsmen, the kind of side who could flay you on a good day. What's more, they were only known to the South Africans as icons of the world game, guys you saw on television and read about in the newspapers. They'd never played them before and knew precious little about them besides what the senior players, Vessels, Kirsten and Caper, had experienced firsthand. Not for the first time, South Africa batted first on the difficult Lancaster Park track and could only cut and paste their way to a measly 200, 18 precious runs coming from extras. As top scorer with 56, Kirsten believes it was his best innings of the tournament. He put on 44 in a second wicket stand with Hudson, 22, and 45 in a fourth wicket stand with Caper, who scored 23. Thankfully, Rhodes on 22, McMillan with 20, and Richardson also with 20, all scored their runs reasonably quickly, and the South Africans clawed their way to a defendable total. Quote, It was a very green, very difficult pitch, very different to the pitches we'd experienced in the first two games in New Zealand remembers Vessels. We felt our 200 gave us a fighting chance. Kirsten had been engaged in some verbal jousting with his old mate, the New Zealander John Wright, since the South Africans had arrived in New Zealand. The two had played together as overseas professionals for Derbyshire, and by the time the West Indies match came around, Kirsten was sick and tired of the Kiwis' insistent ribbing. Quote, that knock against the West Indies was my best innings of the tour, said Kirsten, during a wondrous test against Australia in November 2011. There was a lot of movement early on, but the track was quicker than those prepared for the earlier matches in New Zealand. I was determined to show Wrighty that I could play. We'd played for five seasons at Derby together, and I had something to prove. Of course, the New Zealanders were doing so well in the tournament. That didn't help but I felt it was about time that I make some runs over there. The West Indies game was the place to do it. Enter Merrick Pringle from stage left. Having bowled poorly in the Sydney opener against Australia, his 10 overs cost 52. Pringle didn't play against either New Zealand or Sri Lanka, but was drafted into the side for the fourth game on a pitch that Vessels and Proctor felt would suit him. Bowling his late away swing at good pace, He nipped out opener Brian Lara for nine to start the rot, following it up by accounting for Richie Richardson, one, Carl Hooper, a duck, and Keith Arthurton, a duck, all three wickets falling with a total on 19. There was stout-hearted resistance from Desmond Haynes, who scored 30, and a spirited late flurry from Gus Logie, a 69-ball 61 with nine fours and a six, but the West Indies were unable to recover from their hopeless start and they lost by the surprisingly wide margin of 64 runs. Quote, I bowled the second over of the innings to Lara, remembers Pringle. He smashed my first ball straight past me for four, and the next he drilled through the covers for another four. Then he tried cutting a full-length ball to Jaunty at point, which he caught. Then it all happened. Next was Richardson, leg before wicket, trying to hit me back over my head. Enter Carl Hooper, who was caught by Vessels at first slip, into Arthurton, flashing at a wide one outside off stump and nicking it to Vessels at first slip once again. My World Cup comeback was on track and I never missed another game till the dreaded semi-final against England. It was a dream second match of the tournament for Pringle, rendered all the more special because he may not have played in the World Cup at all. He was a marginal choice for the side, with Northerns' Tertius Bosch ahead of him in the pecking order. But Bosch had overslept before a warm-up match against an Australian Academy eleven in Adelaide at the beginning of the trip. Vessels would hear no excuses and Bosch loitered miserably on the sidelines for the rest of the tour. Pringle himself remembers it slightly differently, saying that he was always aware that he, Snell and Bosch were arm-wrestling for a single place. In the end, it probably came down to a straight gunfight between Bosch and himself, with Bosch losing out after Pringle's remarkable analysis against the West Indians in Christchurch. Jordan remembers that the team and team management were more nervous ahead of the West Indies game than they were before any other game of the tour, bar perhaps the opening friendly against Western Australia in Perth. 
It was a formidable West Indian outfit, and although the side failed to qualify for the semi-finals, players like Malcolm Marshall, Kirtley Ambrose and Winston Benjamin still had a certain cachet for a South African side who had only ever heard about their exploits from afar. Quote, a couple of years later, when I was president at Northerns, I brought Lara out to play for us for a season, remembers Jordan. I remember us chatting on the stoop at my house, and he told me that although he knew we'd felt pressure going into the game, he reminded me that there was incredible pressure on them as well. There was a feeling back in the islands that this was a game they had to win because it was against South Africa, and South Africa hadn't yet become fully democratic or got rid of apartheid completely. There was an added dimension to the pressure on the West Indians. At the ICC meeting in Sharjah after the meeting at Lords, their board had refused to vote in favour of South Africa receiving a last-minute spot in the World Cup. The West Indians argued that they had received no mandate from their constituents and, as a result, could not vote in favour of the South Africans taking part. The West Indian board's dilemma was a tricky one because the precondition upon South Africa playing was that there had to be a 100% vote in their favour at the ICC. The matter was finessed by the West Indians abstaining. They were able to return to their members with a clear conscience, while Vessels' men happily climbed aboard the tournament almost as it was getting started. The win in Christchurch against the West Indians initiated a three-match winning streak, South Africa beating Pakistan in Brisbane three days later, a game that put Rhodes on the map as an international cricketer with his run-out of Inzamamul Haq, and beating Zimbabwe and Canberra two days after that. Provision was made for the South Africans to vote in the referendum at the South African Embassy in the Australian capital after the seven-wicket win against their northern neighbours. In the end, only Jordan and three players, Pringle, Caper and Snell, voted because in order to vote they needed to have both their passports and their identity documents with them. Quote, It was a bit of a bum rule, to be honest, says Jordan. It was more a fluke than anything else that the four of us actually voted. Anyway, we all encouraged the guys to vote, but it was more arse than class that we got it together. Most of the other guys had one or another document missing, so they couldn't vote. Pringle is refreshingly honest when asked about it all. He remembers Vessels telling the team that F.W. de Klerk had phoned after the opening win against Australia. Quote, it was very encouraging indeed, said Vessels, but that the focus was squarely on winning the World Cup and very little that happened off the field persuaded the team to deviate from their mission. When questioned about voting and the shadowy role the referendum might have had on their morale and sense of mission, Pringle is charmingly matter-of-fact. Quote, I don't think we realized how big it was until we got home, but I was proud to have voted and to have remembered both my passport and my identity documents. I carried them with me wherever I went anyway, and voting was a real bonus for me personally. The cricketers voted five or six days before the public went to the polls in South Africa on 17th March. A couple of days before that, Jordan had a long conversation with Jeff Dakin in Adelaide ahead of the South Africans' final group match against India on the 15th of March, a match they needed to win to make sure they remained in the tournament. Present, too, was Peter van Amava, the chairman of South African selectors. Dakin told both of them in no uncertain terms that should the majority of white South Africans vote no, then the team would be pulled out of the World Cup with immediate effect. Dakin didn't want to expose the South African players to a possible resumption of anti-apartheid protesters and felt it was too much to ask the cricketers to perform in conditions of such terrible political ambiguity. On a more concrete level, Dakin had argued at Lord's six months previously with Bacher that apartheid was in its death throes. The argument had been accepted, and so South Africa was readmitted to world cricket. Although at no time did he argue such a line during several telephone interviews with me, it's clear that a wrong referendum result would have exposed him and others in the South African delegation at Lords to accusations of having oversold the reform process. The sensitivities of the moment presented Jordan with a problem. 
Should he communicate Dakin's intentions to the entire team or only to the senior players? Today, Jordan can't remember how he dealt with the matter, but suspects that he might not have made even vessels aware of what would have happened should the vote have had a different outcome. He remembers with greater certainty that he was mindful not to alarm the players in any way whatsoever. Quote, I never said, we are going home. I would have said that if the vote was a no, then we didn't know what would happen and that we might find ourselves back in the wilderness again. But I never would have said we were on the next plane home. Blessed with a fine memory that belies his 76 years, Dakin remembers the conversation with Jordan and Fanimava clearly. Quote, it was at about a quarter to ten at the ground before the India game, he recalls. And it was in response to some press queries about what would happen if the vote back home was no. I chatted to Alan and Peter about it, and I was of the view that it would be an embarrassment if we stayed on if the vote was no. If the government refused to budge, I didn't want to expose the players and ourselves to the wrath of the media and the disappointment of the Australian fans. We would definitely have been coming home. Both of them agreed with me. At Lords, we'd given the ICC an undertaking that apartheid was coming to an end. If that wasn't the case, we'd pull the team out of the World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. In the same way that Jordan kept the players largely out of the loop when it came to the behind-the-scenes intrigues, according to Dakin, there was no concern from either the organising committee or the ICC themselves that one of the World Cup's star attractions might not see the tournament through. Quote, the rest of the cricketing world was uninterested, said Dakin. In their own minds, they had accepted that apartheid was dead, which is what we told them at Lords. And after that, they just wanted us to get on with it and play. Although I must say that the Australians and New Zealanders treated me magnificently. I was their guest and was allowed to bring my wife. We flew first class on Qantas and we stayed in the best hotels. The game against India in Adelaide was a nail-biter because South Africa needed to win it in order to qualify for a place in the semi-finals as one of the tournament's top four placed teams. To add to the drama, it rained for three hours beforehand and the game was reduced to 30 overs each, with South Africa batting second and chasing India's imposing 180 for six. Although slightly expensive, Pringle was rewarded for his return to form by once again being asked to open the bowling. He removed the dangerous Mohammed Azharuddin for 79, and despite a swashbuckling 42 from Kapil Dev, the Indians might have felt that they were 10 to 15 runs shy of a match-winning target. Their attack was hardly the best in the tournament. Sachin Tendulkar, with his mixed bag of off-spinners and leggies, bowled six of the 30 overs, and it might have been the best from their point of view to have put the match out of reach early. With the South Africans knowing nothing of Dakin's insistence that they were to be brought home should the referendum result reveal that whites were disinclined to change, Vessels took a gamble. He sent the light-footed Kirsten out to open the innings with Hudson, a master stroke that proved inspirational as the two clipped along to forge an opening stand of 128. Quote, When Kepler asked me to open, I accepted immediately, Kirsten tells me. We started slowly... I think we only scored 15 runs off the first five overs, but after that it became easier. With Hudson's departure for an invaluable 53, there followed the dreaded mid-innings wobble, with Caper and Rhodes only managing seven each, but Vessels, batting at five and Cronier batting at six, were able to finish off the match with five balls to spare. Kirsten's 84 off 86 balls was a masterpiece. His gloriously fluent knock was the golden thread on which the team travelled to Melbourne and to their semi-final with England. Unlike the case with many of South Africa's other World Cup matches, there was a familiarity and shared history between England and South Africa. Pringle believes it sharpened the needle between the teams, adding a constantly bubbling subtext to the semi-final. Quote, The England side consisted of Graham Gooch, who played as an overseas player for Western Province, he recalled. They also had Alan Lamb, who was an ex-South African, and Graham Hick, an ex-Zimbabwean, in their side. 
I just don't think that they wanted to lose to us in any way at all. Shared history or not, England had beaten South Africa by three wickets in their group game and, along with New Zealand, were the tournament's form team. South Africa knew they had reason to be wary. The semi-final was the biggest game of their lives thus far. Batting first, England tottered slightly with both Gooch, 2 and Ian Botham, 21, out by the time the total was on 39. But after Hick, batting at 4, was caught by Vessels at first slip off a no ball early in his innings, the balance of the match tilted in England's favour. Hick went on to make 83, while feisty cameos down the order from Dermot Reeve, 25 not out, Lamb, 19, and Chris Lewis, 18 not out, ensured England crashed through the 250-run barrier to post 252. Quote, We just didn't bowl that well in the semi, Vessels tells me, stressing Hicks' almost dismissal as a key moment in the match. Conceding 23 extras was also unhelpful. As well as six no balls, nine wides were bowled. There were also seven leg buys and a bye. Sensing the possibility of rain, Vessels remembered having a word with the SCG curator before the match started. The groundsman told him that at some point in the match it was going to rain for between 15 and 20 minutes. When this was, he couldn't say, but it would definitely rain before the match was over. It transpired in actual fact that it rained twice, once during England's innings and once during South Africa's fateful run chase. Both Vessels and Pringle confirmed that the rain during the England innings was significantly worse than it was when it rained later on, an anomaly that has always riled the South Africans. Quote, when we were fielding, the rain was coming down harder than it was when we went off when we were batting, remembers Pringle. As a good captain, Vessels chatted to umpire Steve Randell after the first break, pointing out that should rain fall again, in the interests of fairness, the rain needed to be of equal strength to what it was the first time round if the teams were to troop off. Quote, the moment we went off the second time, I knew we were gone, says Vessels, adding that he's subsequently been told that had the Duckworth-Lewis formula been in operation then, South Africa would have narrowly won by three runs, although he acknowledges that this hasn't been independently confirmed elsewhere. The Australian press familiar with Sydney's bylaws, had no truck with the rain theory whatsoever. They maintained that what ate into the available time was that the South Africans' paltry overrate, a fact confirmed by John Bishop, who is covering the tour for the Maritzburg newspaper The Natal Witness. Quote, the loss was no more than the result of us bowling our overs so slowly. Neutrals and the Aussie press said that we deserved it, he remembers. There was no great rhythm to South Africa's chase, as the partnerships of 26 for the first wicket, 35 the second wicket, and 29 the third wicket indicate. Kirsten's wicket for 11 with the total on 90 was bad enough, but Caper's dismissal for 36 with the total on 131 was crucial, in that he would have given the South African innings the middle overs boost it so obviously needed. Quote, Adrian batted at four and was just beginning to get going. He hit a one-bounce four which landed just in front of me, remembers Jordan. If he'd batted for just one or two more overs, we would have won that game against England. I remember it well because we were being entertained by the former Australian left-arm seamer Alan Davidson in his box, and I remember thinking that if Adrian could pull off one of those explosive innings we all knew he was capable of, then we would make it into the final. It was not to be. Although the target was revised by one run, the winning total coming down to 252 after England's best 43 overs were taken into account, a progressive loss of overs saw South Africa initially needing to score 22 runs from 13 balls with Macmillan at Richardson at the crease. With further time lost, the number of balls remaining was reduced yet again, and South Africa suddenly needed 22 runs off a single delivery. McMillan reluctantly dropped his bat on the final delivery in the match and jogged through for a heavy-hearted single. Amidst anguish and regret, the players standing on the SCG balcony wet-eyed in disbelief, 
South Africa's World Cup dream was over in the worst way imaginable. Quote, I had a bit of a calf problem in that game and was bowled out by Phil de Freitas cheaply, so it wasn't a happy night for me, recalls Kirsten. It all ended up being pretty anticlimactic. My feeling was that the man upstairs was saying, you just can't expect that much this soon. It was Kepler and Mike's idea to go on the lap of honour afterwards. That was a nice touch. Pringle was distraught on the night and his distress is still palpable. Quote, it was one of my worst memories ever. Had we gone through to the final, Pakistan would have had their backs against the wall because we beat them in a warm-up game and then we beat them in Brisbane with a famous jaunty run-out. I really, really believe we would have won the World Cup if it was not for that silly system where we lost all those balls. Having said this, it was an awesome experience to play against the world's best cricketers for the first time, and I will never forget that. Despite the inconsistency surrounding South Africa's semi-final loss to England, Vessels believes that it was a remarkably successful tournament when one takes their naivety and comparative rawness into account. Quote, we prepared incredibly well, he tells me, during the first test against Sri Lanka at Centurion in December 2011. We played as well as we could have played. There was no real preparation in New Zealand. That was a problem. But the 92 World Cup was the one World Cup that was a success for us as a country. The side's greenness was such that Jordan remembers a two-hour bus trip from Sydney to Bowral, Don Bradman's hometown to play a limited over pre-tournament friendly. Rain sluicing across New South Wales meant that the match was eventually abandoned, but the trip was undertaken anyway. The South Africans were looking forward to reacquainting themselves with an old South African great, Barry Richards, and meeting a happening young Australian quick by the name of Brett Lee. Quote, The luxury buses we travelled in all had video facilities, explains Jordan, and it was my job to find videos of the players we were going to be playing against to find out if they were left or right-handers. We literally didn't know a thing. Okay, there was a player here and there that we'd had experience of, but by and large the guys didn't know very much about the opposition at all. Vessels was the linchpin in the South African system. His selection as captain and vindication of Fanamava and his co-selector's decision to appoint him instead of Rice. He was hard, fair and incredibly loyal to his players, although he could be autocratic and had an undoubted streak of inflexibility. Still, he would argue that he implied the same harshly puritanical standards to himself that he applied to his players. He was fabulously fit, watched his diet like a hawk, and had regular vitamin B12 injections and consumed Epsom salts religiously. Indeed, his definition of letting his hair down was to order a toasted sandwich and an orange juice from room service, as he did after the opening nine-wicket win against Australia. But, like everyone, Vessels had his blind spots. As the long tour progressed, the players began to tire and carry an assortment of niggles. South Africa played the very last match of the first round, so when they started the tournament their schedule was more compact than that of most other teams. As a result, Vessels, Proctor and Jordan needed to grapple with the hoary issue of non-compulsory practices. Jordan recalls that Vessels reluctantly accepted the need for players to have a day off to play a round of golf, do some shopping or go to the beach, but would inevitably complain about so-and-so's non-appearance afterwards. Quote, It was one of our traditions to have a team meal together on the eve of the match, says Jordan. When we arrived in Auckland, some of the Muslim guys, Omar Henry, Faik Davids and Yassin Beg, the latter two on tour for the experience alone, asked to be excused because they had found a halal restaurant nearby, the first they'd seen on tour so far. Kepler, Mike and I spoke about it, and we agreed to let them go. Kepler must have had second thoughts, because afterwards he really came down hard on them. Perhaps a little surprisingly, given his commitment to the Protestant work ethic, Vessels was opposed to a curfew, and after hours the players came and went as they pleased. Girlfriends and wives were not allowed on tour though, the feeling being that they would be an unwelcome diversion. While team management tried to ration the social demands, Jordan spoke regularly on tour and Dakin, 
who was there for the second half of the tournament, gave occasional brilliant speeches. Honouring a fair number of engagements remained a public relations necessity. There were also political demands, sometimes from unexpected quarters, such as an anti-apartheid protester Alan Minto's surprising appearance at Auckland Airport when the South Africans flew into New Zealand for the first time. Quote, As we were flying out of Sydney, I bumped into Donald Woods at Sydney Airport, recalls Jordan, Donald Woods being the newspaper editor of the East London Daily Dispatch and a man who wrote a biography on Steve Biko. I'd heard that he was covering the tour for an English newspaper, but you must remember that he wasn't exactly popular back home. Most of us thought he was a bit of a communist, and we were suspicious about his views. Anyway, I walked over and introduced myself, and we hit it off immediately. We arranged to sit next to each other on the flight to Auckland, and we chatted the whole way. He was very pro the tour, and I found him very reasonable and balanced. So we land and there are television cameras everywhere and suddenly Alan Minto, the anti-apartheid protester, is waving a petition in front of my face and telling me that I have to sign it because he says each player must disassociate himself from current South African government policy. I tell him that we're going to do nothing of the sort and he says to me that he and his group might need to take further action. Anyway, we got the acting minister of sports Steve Schwerte involved who tried to convince them about the credibility of the tour, but he had real difficulties with them. They didn't seem to understand. Minto phoned me the following morning to ask again what our position was on signing his document, and I told him what I told him at the airport the first time. I then gave him Donald's number. Donald had said to me that he would personally see to it that these allegations were put to bed, and he was as good as his word. I never heard another thing from Minto and his bunch again. The cricket landscape was very different in 1992. The international game hadn't yet encountered the Asian betting syndicates. Duckworth Lewis was not yet a gleam in either man's eye, and bat manufacture was, comparatively speaking, still in the dark ages. It was a pre-cell phone age of faxes and unwieldy technology. The use of video as a coaching aid was unheard of. There was no Indian Premier League and no Champions League, and the sale of broadcast rights had yet to become the multi-million dollar business that it is today. Filing for journalists was long-winded and painful, many of them grappling constantly with the strange deadlines dictated to them by time differences between Australasia and home. Bishop lived on five Australian dollars a day, filching food where he could and jumping into other folks' taxis, such as the time he caught a lift with Woods on the way to Melbourne Airport early one morning. Quote, My mate Peter Robinson, who was filing for the Argus Group back in South Africa, was sailing round in great luxury while I was sleeping on his hotel room floor and stealing bacon off plates where I could, Bishop tells me. Still, it was a wonderful experience. I'll never forget that he and I were locked into the SCG after the Australia game because we had so many stories to write. Such was the demand back home. Eventually they turned the lights out at the SCG and everyone went home. We had to scale a wall to get out of the stadium. The team itself travelled to the World Cup with only two support staff, Jordan and team physiotherapist Craig Smith, and the players were expected to some degree to be self-sufficient, monitoring their diet and ensuring they got a good night's rest. Jordan was exceptionally helpful, but there were certain things he wouldn't do, like acting as a screen for calls from female admirers and groupies. The fact that the team wasn't mollycoddled by ballooning starfish shrinks, glorified ball boys and technical consultants probably served them well. Players were required to think their way out of cul-de-sacs and will themselves over blind rises. The 1992 team was certainly one of the more emotionally intelligent and capable sides to ever participate in a World Cup for South Africa. The sports culture of dependence, whether on psychologists or technical analysts, had yet to be born. It would take a while, but when it did, South African cricket would embrace it with all the ardour of those fearful of being left behind. Casting an eye over the scoreboard suggests that totals were prehistoric by contemporary standards. 
The highest scoring teams in the 92 competition, who were England and New Zealand, were scoring at not much more than five runs per over, while the South Africans often had to be content with four and over or thereabouts. The strategy, according to Vessels, was self-conscious. It was the way they wanted to play, although it didn't always find favour back home in South Africa. Experimentation, such as it was, was careful, creating a template that South African cricket has been saddled with ever since. Having seen the Kiwis play with some brio and innovation in Auckland, great batch given licence to swing from the start in the absence of the more favoured right, the South Africans tried to implement some changes with Caper in the pinch-hitting role. Unaccountably, Caper had an indifferent tournament. He was unable to play the explosive game so many had hoped he would and was marginal to South Africa's overall effort, probably providing better value with the ball than with the bat. Despite his disappointments, the South Africans played magnificently. There was a successful World Cup, a place in the final cruelly snatched away by a technicality when they felt it might just have been in their grasp. As Buta Dipinar puts it, quote, I remember that World Cup well because I watched it back home and I always thought it was the greatest way to leave a World Cup without actually winning it. It was a gracious way to exit.